So in this video, we're going to talk about central tendencies of the brain. We're also going to talk about what central tendency actually means. So starting out, I'm actually going to rework my station here. So central tendency is a measurement that helps us measure the center of the data. It's really not any more complex than that in terms of definitions. So we have three different ways that we could potentially measure our data um, in terms of central tendency. We have mean, median, and mode, which by this point in your math career, I'm sure you've heard about all three of those. Um, the mean is what we typically think of as the average. The median is the actual center number if our data is listed in numerical order, that means smallest to largest. Um, if we have an even number, we just take the average of those middle two values. And then mode is the number that occurs most often. Usually we don't use this to measure the center as much. Um, simply because it's possible that your mode might not necessarily be a very good measurement of the center of your data, um, but we'll look at some distributions and talk about when mode would be more beneficial. So the next thing we do need to talk about, um, just some definition things here. An outlier, I'm sure you've heard of this before, an outlier is something that is outside of the general tendency of our other data. So either it's way above or way below our general chunk of data. And if we have an outlier, it is going to skew the mean. So if I have an outlier that's higher than all of my data, it's going to pull the mean up higher. If I have an outlier that's lower, then the mean is going to get pulled lower. So in that case, if I do have an outlier, it's usually better to use the median or the mode, or excuse me, yes, the median or the mode. Um, but we'll, we're going to have a day later on this week where we look at the outliers a little bit more in depth. Um, and do some calculations with outliers and all that, but this is just a general uh, vocab day. So looking at some actual data, I'm going to show you how to find the mean and the median using Desmos. So I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to go over to Desmos. So the first thing I need to do is actually put my data into Desmos. So we're going to hit the plus. We're going to add an item and we're going to add a table. And you're going to put all of that information into X1. I've already done that. So take a minute and put all of your information into X1 and then come back and restart the video when you have all of that in. So you are going to need to open up your keyboard down here. And I'm going to add an expression. And I'm going to just drag this up to the top so we can see it a little bit better. So opening up my keyboard, I'm going to go down here into functions. And I'm going to go under stats. That's statistics. And you'll notice right away that it says mean and median right in the list for us. So I'm going to do the mean first, and I'm going to do x1. Now in order to do 1 as a subscript, I need to hit this ABC button, and it's this button right here, so I'm going to hit that. Nope, nope. There we go. I'm going to hit that. I can put my subscript of 1. In this case, you don't have to close the parentheses, but you can. So now I know that the mean of the data that I put in my list one is 
And I'm going to do the same thing for median. So I'm going to go back to my keyboard here. I'm going to hit functions. I'm going to do median. And I'm going to do x subscript 1, not 12. And that tells me the median is 86. So going back to my actual question, it says our teacher is going to use a measure of center for all of the grades. So our mean was 85.3 and our median was 86. So a couple of questions that they could ask you. What measure of center would you hope the teacher would use? Well, if we're looking at the grade, I, 86 is better than an 85.3. But the question is, do you think everyone in the class would be happy with this grade? Well, everybody whose grade was less than an 86 would be totally fine with that, especially these people that were down here. Let's see. I'm sure the 80 and the 82 and the 83 would be fine with it. The 85 would be okay. This person would probably not really care because it's the same grade. But all of these people that had a grade that was higher than an 86. Oh, that guy would count for the. So that gives one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people that would probably be pretty unhappy if the teacher used a measure of center instead of their actual grade, especially this one right here. So those are just examples of some questions that you could be given in this type of unit. I will say complete sentences are extremely beneficial, especially in our statistics unit, because you're going to have to explain your reasoning with the data that's been given. All right, so another question about measure of center. I know that the um, table did not print on yours. Um, so go ahead and pause and then go and add your data into a new table. So I'm going to come to this one here and just add these in really quick. Oops, and make sure you don't do a comma. 865, 9, 10, Sorry, I thought I had this already in here. Guess I didn't. 8, 25, and 9, 15. Okay, so we want to know, adding an expression, we want to know, whoops, what would be a better measure of center? So the mean of x1, so $9.89, or the median of x subscript 1 is 8.7. So looking at our data, I'm going to go ahead and write this on my sheet really quick. The mean was 9 89 and the median was eight dollars and seventy cents so I'm going to go back to my other screen so looking here based on the data that we have here let's make that a little clearer there we go most of our values are between eight dollars or really low in the $9 range. This $18.50 
would be an outlier. Now, I'm not going to do the calculations to prove that to you right now, but that is considered an outlier. That is why this mean here does not accurately show where my data lives for the most part. Um, so this is that mean value is skewed because of that outlier. So because of that, our median would be a better measure of center because we have this really high outlier. This might be a person that works in security or in the control room or doing some technological stuff. That, that might be an explanation as to why that one person is making a lot more than everybody else. They might be ticket holders or, or um, people that are selling food in this, the vending machine or the food station. So the these lower values are probably more of a I don't want to say menial, that sounds wrong, but not as important, so to speak, as the person who might be doing some tech stuff. All right, so three different types of graphs that we're going to look at. We have a dot plot, a histogram, and a box and whisker plot, or a box plot. And I have an example of all three of them here for you. So this is a dot plot, this is a histogram, and this is a box plot. I guess I should actually. Okay, so when we look at any of these three types of graphs, we can look at the shape of the distribution. So my examples are histograms, but we can see the same thing in a dot plot or a, excuse me, or a box plot. So if it looks pretty symmetrical, that's going to be a normal distribution. If I was looking at a box plot, both of the Whiskers would be about the same length, and these two pieces inside the box would be the same. So everything looks very even. If it's uniform, everything looks about the same. There's really no clear peak. All of these bins look about the same height. So uniform is just that. Everything is pretty similar. So we also have skewed data. So if it's skewed to the right, that means the tail is coming out to the right. If this was a box plot, I would see a lot of my data clumped up here on the left, and I would see a long tail that goes out to the right. On the flip side, if it's skewed left, it's the exact opposite. So I would see my data clumped to the right and the long tail out to the left. So the next few slides here are walking you through how to create a histogram and a box plot in your TI-80 whatever you have calculator. I'm going to show you how to do this in Desmos. So if you go ahead and switch over to Desmos, we'll just use the, um, this was the amusement park. We'll just use the amusement park for right now. So I'm going to add an expression. I'm just going to drag this up to the top so it's easier for you to see. I'm going to open my keyboard. I'm going to go back to functions. 
but now instead of being under stats, I'm going to go under distribution. And you'll see right here, I have three different visualizations that we could do, our histogram, dot plot, and box plot. I'm going to do our histogram first. So I'm going to do a histogram. I have to tell Desmos what data set I'm using, X1 or Y1, and the bin width. That means how wide our rectangles are going to be. So my data set is X1, so I'm going to put that in. And since this is money, let's say that our bin width will make it 75 cents. Oops. 0 0.7. Why is it going down? I want it up. Zero. Mm -hmm. X1. Arrow over. Comma. 0 0.75. There we go. Lord have mercy. That was harder than it needed to be. Okay. So, right now, this doesn't really give me a good picture having my bin width be 75 cents. I have three bars. Not super helpful. So that tells me that maybe I should change my bin width. Maybe I'll do it within 25 cents. That's a little bit better of a picture. If I change this to, let's say, 15 cents, it's going to look different. If I change it to 50 cents, it really doesn't look all that different from 75 cents. So whatever you choose for your bin with, and this is not a super great example because there's not as much data. We're going to do this with the test grades in just a second. But either way you look at it, I have a clump of data here. And then this one lonely 1850 chilling out here. This is data that is skewed right because the tail is out to the right. So I'm going to go over here back to my test grades. This is a lot more data, so it'll be a much better picture for us. So I'm going to add an expression. Oops, I already did that. Just kidding. I'm going to go back to my functions, and we're going to do a histogram and a box plot for this example. Um, so I'm going to do a histogram here. Again, my data set is x1. Make sure you arrow over. It automatically sets our bin width to 1, but in this case, because I'm looking at test grades, and I have a pretty good spread here. I'm going from 77 to 96. I'm going to make my bin width 2 just for right now, and then we're going to play around with it a little bit. So this automatically sets the bin alignment the way that it's spread out to center. We do want to switch that to, say, left, because that is typical of how you would see a box plot, or excuse me, a histogram, because we're looking at a histogram, um, it will typically be uh, on the left. That means my bars end at the left, and it shows me, so this bin right here goes from 76 to 78. You'll notice if I switch it to center, it looks totally different. But we want it to say left. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Now, one thing you'll notice, I have all of my numbers shown here. It's probably pretty likely that your Desmos does not show you this right now. And I'm going to show you what I did. So one thing I did is I turned off the minor grid lines because that just added a whole bunch of extra stuff and made my eyes go crazy. So I took out my minor grid lines, 
This is the important part. If that step is not there, your graph is going to look totally different. So I'm going to put a step of 1, and I'm actually going to do the same thing for y. Now the reason I did that is now I can very quickly see that between the scores of 76 and 78, there was only one person that had that score. If I look between 88 and 90, there were one, two, three, four people that scored in this chunk between 88 and 90. So I can clearly see the actual number of people that fall within that range or that bin. So here, if we look at a shape, we're kind of steadily increasing and then we drop off and we have a little bit of a tail. You could say that this is skewed to the right because it has that outlier up there at the top. If that score between 86 and 80, or excuse me, 96 and 98 wasn't there, then I would maybe say it was skewed left. If you cover up that one box, it's kind of out by itself. Well, then it looks like my tail's kind of out to the left. This isn't a really great graph to show you skew. I'm going to show you better ones in just a second. But, okay, so that was making a histogram. I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm going to make a box plot. So I just added my expression, and I'm going to go back to functions, and I'm going to click box plot, and I need to enter the data set. So I'm going to do x subscript 1, and you'll notice that it's currently lying right on top of my histogram. This property here called offset allows me to shift it up higher on the y-axis so that my box plot and my histogram aren't overlapping. So let's say if I put it up here at 6, I know it's going to be out of the way of my histogram. So both of these are called whiskers. These are inside of the box itself. We're going to go into way more detail about a box plot itself. But for today, we're just looking at measures of center and how it's spread out. So here, one thing I'm noticing is the box is pretty large. And this tail out here to the right is longer than the tail out here to the left. So that, again, is an indication to me that I might want to consider saying this is skewed right. Um, but let's look at some better examples. So here, this represents some caloric data for a variety of different fast food sandwiches. And they're going to ask us what we think think about the data, what the shape is, what it tells us about cholesterol in these fast food sandwiches. Well, I definitely see a skewed right shape in both the box plot and the histogram. I can see it really well in the histogram. And that's skewed right because the tail is out to the right. Um, so let's see. This is a minimum of 40. And my this tells me the smallest number and the biggest number. And this tells me my bin width. This is what it would look like if you were using a TI-84 or 6 or whatever they are now. Um, so this is between 40 and... 49. So I would say most of 
the sandwiches fall below a milligram measurement of 50. So for the most part, we're getting less than 50 milligrams of cholesterol in our fast food sandwiches in general based on our data. However, it is possible that you are getting much more than 50 milligrams of cholesterol in your fast food sandwich. But because our data is skewed right, most of our data is going to live down here in the 40 range.